Hello and welcome to The Sanctuary, a safe space to speak from the heart. I'm your host, Israel, and my guest today, super awesome, talented artist, songwriter, uh, nominated for a number of awards, and it's going to be performing at this year's Cavendish Beach Music Festival. Chris Ryan, thanks for coming to The Sanctuary today. Israel, my man, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, you know, first of how, <laughs> let's say, is this going to be like the first big festival you've played since 2019, 2020? Yeah, this this is, uh, well, no, I, I played um, I played a couple back home. So like on, on top of being a singer songwriter, I also do some guitar work for a couple different artists. So last year we got to do George Street Festival uh, with a country artist from back home. I play guitar and band leader for uh, Justin Fancy. Uh, he just won Fan Choice uh, the ECMA of the Year, uh, or, or Fan Choice Artist of the Year for the ECMAs. Um, <clears throat> and if, if for the life of me, all oh, right, it was the Rec Laws and Robin Adelini. So we got to do that festival, which is great. And George Street Festival for me is kind of like one of those special ones because it's like the hometown festival. You know, I've played it a few times with a, with a bunch of different acts once myself. And, uh, but yeah, this is definitely going to be the biggest <laughs> since 2019. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just picturing as an artist, you know, the vibe you get from the crowd is one of those things that actually makes the performance. I'm, I'm guessing because I've noticed that, you know, when you are performing live, there is, a, you know, a different level, I guess. Um, how much of that did you miss the last couple of years? Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's certainly, it's certainly different to sing to a computer screen for those live streams and stuff. You know what I mean? Like uh, yeah. you, you go, you go, you go from a stage of playing to like three to 5,000 people to singing to your computer screen that you look at every day and that you watch Netflix on. <laughs> and it's just kind of like, it's precarious, but there's, there's just, there's, I, I'm so excited. You know, country music has such an awesome uh, fan base and they're very receptive mm. and they're very interactive. So that's what I love about, you know, that's why I'm so, that's one of the things I'm so excited about with Cavendish is because, you know, you know that whether it's 50 or 20,000, um, they're all going to completely embrace you as an artist because they're there to listen to music mm. you know they're all they're all paying for their tickets so i mean they're there for a reason and it's not just the beer because they can get that at the 7-eleven down the road <laughs> very true <laughs> very true very true um yeah so one thing i i, I was reading your buy and and there there is a there is a special to me, like just going through some of the song lyrics you've written and, and performed, there is this vibe I get that there's some of you in the songs you write. Did I read that wrong? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, I think there's a, I, I think a part of that just brings authenticity to the music. And I think that, um, you know, when you, when you create a fan base, um, big or small, whatever it is, I think some part of that just gravitates to the music and gravitates to you. So they listen to it because, you know, they they can hear either them, a part of themselves or they can hear, you know, like they, they, can, they can relate to what they're listening to. And I think that that's kind of like a gravitational thing. I think that that's not just country music. I think that that's just music in general, you know, like, I'm a big fan of, of, of so many different artists. My, my, my family are basically Springsteen freaks. <laughs> so, uh, but it's because, you know, like we, we came from a big car family. Like my dad is a muscle car guy and, and you listen to all these songs and like, you know, like, like Thunder Road, you're listening to lyrics about, 
uh, you know, like street racing and, and jump it. Like, you know, it's, you know, it, it's a town for the losers and we'll pull out of here to win. Like all these fun lyrics and like amazing lyrics, but they, they, they just like, they relate to people. And I think that that's something really important. And that's what I try to do when I'm writing music. Mm, is mm. is relate to me and but at the same time relate to other people's situations yeah no i yeah i feel it especially with the new one less of a stranger i've been listening to it over and over kind of preparing for this and love it when you're working on a song which comes first i guess the melody the music the lyrics the words How, <laughs> how's it what's your process I, I don't necessarily have a like a specific process. I, I find it's kind of both. Mm. Like uh, I was in a write last week and I started playing. I, I started playing something and then my co-writer slash producer, he was like, oh, dang, I like that. Like, let's go that way. And I was like, okay. So then, but then the, on the other side of it, you could go into it and, um, just have an idea, you know, like have a, have a hook or have a chorus like notion. And I know, I know that there are writers out there that specifically do it one way or the other. Mm. But for me, it's, just, I just like, there's no necessary process. I just want to make sure that I write a good song. You know, I don't want to, like and don't get me wrong, we've all written something that we're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> and yes, I made that face intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like this. But um, <laughs> you know, I think I think the most important thing is just making sure that it's 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 a good song, and mm -hmm. whether that comes from a great melody, whether that comes from a great hook, whether that comes from a great uh, chord structure. Um, for me, I'm, I just want to write a great song. Mm. You know, I mean, even though you have some moments when you do that face, I, I think, you know, just from your self-titled albums and the songs I've listened to, you do achieve that. And, and that led you to, you know, working with Kelly Preston and also getting, um, getting the, um, getting on sound of pop how did that yeah. happen uh well it's funny uh that one that one goes back a few years so uh tim hardy who is also my manager um used to work with a company called socan and of course socan is the company that makes us songwriters get paid for our royalties um and he like we just basically struck up a great relationship and then he left socan and partnered up with uh glenn mcmillan who's an amazing man uh and he's the founder of sound of pop so the two of them kind of partnered up and um shortly thereafter yeah i got the i got the call i signed up with those guys and they've been fantastic uh i think we've got some news coming up soon i don't know if i can share it just yet but uh we've uh you know what those guys what they do it's it's amazing and you know it's 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 great for us artists we have an amazing roster with sound of pop with Colt of raven um chris kirby uh tomato tomato fm berlin i mean the list just goes on and on and on and they're all fantastic artists and the, and the thing that i love about it you know it's a publishing label so it's not kind of genre specific mm. You know, we've got Americana, we've got country, we've got rock, we've got alternative, we've got like there's everything there, and and, and every one of them are fantastic artists. Um, but it's also great because they have relationships with other companies, other publishing companies throughout Canada. So you have the opportunity to write with people with Simba Music or you know different artists throughout um, the Sound of Pop roster. So um, they've been they've been very instrumental for me and they've been, you know, one of the reasons that I'm still doing this to be completely honest, because the support's just fantastic. And I think that that in this industry, I think that that's a very important thing. I think support is 
crucial to the success of any artist. Mm, mm. You know, I'm shaking my head because I, I totally agree with that. You know, it's like, yeah, kind of on the battlefield and you know the reserves you have, like, you know, the backup you have is great. You can go ahead and do the thing you want to, the things you want to do because you know the support you have will get you to where you want to go. Talking about sound of pub and publishing, um, one thing uh, that I also find is licensing. I love watching TV. I mean, <laughs> I'm a film nerd, and I feel that sometimes you know having the right song in the right scene can take the film to another level, right? Um, how do you find licensing working with Sound of Pop? Um, I mean, it's great. You're very right. Like when we do, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when we, um, when we do these tunes, we, 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 when we submit them into the company, um, we submit them both, uh, with the lyrics of the actual song, or we submit the instrumental part because in some situations, um, it's not necessarily the lyrics. Sometimes it's just the it, it's just the music that kind of sets the mode in in that individual moment. Um, and I think that that um, that's kind of cool too because I'm like I'm 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 on the road aside from last year and the year before, but <laughs> but uh, like when I'm traveling, I'm always like I'm watching something. You know what I mean? Like. I think I've rewatched Sons of Anarchy and Entourage and Californication probably I don't know twenty times over just because <laughs> it's it's just it's just easy, right? And I'm the type of person that um, and my girlfriend, God bless her, she hates it, but uh, <laughs> I, I I I go to like I can't I can't just get in the bed and go to sleep. Yeah. Like I just have something on in the background. So, um, yeah, it's, it's funny because I, uh, I like, I do watch that, but it, it's amazing how just those, just that moment of, uh, you know, like a string section coming in or something a lot like, you know, or a chord progression comes in to set the mood for a certain scene. And a lot of times when it's instrumental, it's like a, it's a scene that, you know, is detrimental to that episode or movie or whatever the case may be. So mm. one of the coolest things, Israel, I'll tell you, that I've ever experienced when I was working in Nashville in 2016, uh, I got to go to Ocean Wave Studios and uh, watch them uh, record. I think it was for like, it was either for a video game or for a commercial, but it was like a 40 piece orchestra. Wow. And they're doing like the background, just the background music and the background score. And watching that happen from behind the scenes was like, it was mind blowing. Like it was super cool. And I was amazed at how articulate and how efficient they were. Because I mean, you go to Nashville, it's the best, you know, you're getting the best session musicians in the world. And to be able to see that was, it was something special. I'm not going to lie. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um. You mentioned something about, you know, your dad being to cars and the music you listened to growing up influencing kind of what you're writing. But I'll, I want to touch a bit on that and, and talk about like, how did this whole music thing really start for you? Was it just listening to music? Did you, Grew up in a family that everyone played an instrument. What's the story there? Uh, well, the old school, the old school joke. One of the funniest things my father has ever said is that he couldn't carry a note in the bucket. Um. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I did. I did. I did have. Uh, I have an uncle who played guitar um, my entire upbringing, and, and I kind of gravitated to him. Uncle Tony Ryan. He was a teacher. Um, but he had a beautiful mid eighties Telecaster that was, uh, it was like, that was, that was my, that was the love of my life when I was growing up. And anytime I could get my hands on it, it was awesome. It had two, 
it had two distinct teeth marks on the on the headstock because his cat bit it one time. Yeah. But um, he, you know, he he was pretty instrumental. Um, no pun intended in me getting into music. And from there, I just kind of like, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to play. I sang going through grade school. I sang in the choir and music programs and that sort of thing. Mm. And uh, I, I just, like, I wanted to, first I just wanted to learn. And then as I got older, I started to kind of like write things. And when I, I remember writing one of my first ever songs, I was probably 18 years old. No, I was, well, I was younger than that. Cause I, I actually wrote, I wrote the graduation song for my high school grad. Oh, wow. Um, but w- like once I had learned, um, then I wanted to create and that's kind of where it went. Like my parents weren't musical. We had some some family members who married into my mother's side who who played a little bit. You know, I, I grew up in Newfoundland. Like what they say about kitchen parties, it's it's not a cliche. It's not a joke. Like you know, we grew up and we had it was a kitchen party and everybody sat around the kitchen and we just were sponges. Myself and my cousins. Um, we were sponges and we took it in the adults sat around, they, you know, they had a beer or two or a glass of wine or whatever. And there was an accordion and there was a guitar and there was, I don't know, there was fiddles and there was like, ev- everything was always around. And like, that was a Friday, Saturday night, like, you know, <laughs> mm. and, it, and it was, and, and what I think what I loved about it, and this is not meant to sound weird, but I loved like watching the attention and the command that these people would have of a room, Mm. you know, once they started playing, whatever was going on in the room stopped. Mm. So if they were fighting over the lease and the Habs or the, you know, like whatever, as soon as they started talking or as soon as the guitar came out, they started playing whatever it was, Mm. the room was commanded. And to me, I, I like when I think back about it now, now that I've been able to play in front of, you know, however many people and, and, and get into a room where people are listening and waiting to, you know, like for your next line or for your next note. <clears throat> um, to me, that's like, that's powerful. Mm. That's special to be able to, because, you know, like at the end of the day, if you, if you have the opportunity, you could be making someone's night. And I've said this before, but the way that people relate to music, one of the things that I think about is um, you never know what that person, what a specific person is going through when they go to a concert. Mm. So a certain line you know, like like songs hit people differently regardless, but a certain line may, you know, it might, I know I've experienced it before where you're like, you, you, you hear something and it's like, man, I'm like, that's me. I'm going through that. Mm. I feel that. And to me that I think it like, you know, it all comes from the powerfulness of just being like, yes, I come from a fantastic family. Uh, some musical, some not, but uh, to me, it just all relates back to being able to deliver something that you created that changes somebody's perspective. Mm. Yeah, music is very powerful and it touches right, touches you right in your heart. So when you listen, like you said, when you listen to a lyric, some one person, hundreds of people might relate to that specific line. But like, you know, you have this experience, you write for your school band, um, school's graduation, you write this song for it. At what point do you think, okay, you know, this is what I want to do? Well, it's funny. I, 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 I worked at a music store. I started when I was 15 years old uh, and I worked at a music retail store, a local store in St. John's, Newfoundland. And um, I... 
I always wanted to play. You know, like I always wanted that gig. I wanted to play. Once I started playing at like 12 years old or whatever it was, 12, 13 or something, um, I always wanted to, uh, you know, get on the stage. I wanted to get out there and feel like I was a rock star, even though I was absolutely friggin' terrible. But uh, I wanted, I, I wanted it, you know, like I, I, I wanted to entertain. I wanted to perform. And uh, by work at the music store, I ended up meeting um, for those for those listeners who don't know about George Street. Uh, that's basically like the entertainment district uh, in in St. John's. Like that's that's our Broadway. That's our you know that's our strip. And a bunch of the bar owners would shop at our store, so I would get to know them. And of course, I was this pipsqueak of a kid who you know, played hockey a little bit and played hockey a little bit, but like was always torn between, did I want to be a hockey player? Did I want to be a musician or did I want to do something? Mm. And then I like the guys who were, because I was working at the music store and they were shopping at our store. Some of the bar owners would be like, yeah, okay, sure. We'll throw you a gig. And I was like, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure. <sighs> And I'm like, all right, awesome, cool. And then I'd talk to one of the, like, you know, all the guys in the store who worked there played. He's like, yeah, I got a gig, I got a gig, I got a gig. And they're like, okay, cool, what are you going to play? I was like, <laughs> now <Chris>. like, <laughs> right? like, yeah, okay, like, I literally badgered these people for however long into trying to hire me for a gig. Now they've given me one, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. What am I going to do? <laughs> so, I went, I remember, I'll never forget as long as I live. I wasn't always, like, I was, I always loved country music, but, like, when I was a kid, I was like, you know, Silver Chair and Green Day and Springsteen and Ro- Blue Rodeo and uh, so, anyways, I'm juggling through all these things. I'll never forget it. I my my parents one year gave me one of these. Uh, it was a Sony, uh, like however many CD changer. I can't remember, but it was it was aggressive. And um, anyways, I. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never forget. I'm running through and I'm hitting play, and it comes up and it's like uh, Silver Chair's Frog Stomp. I was like, ah, no, nobody wants to hear that. So I hit next, and I go to the basically what you would do now on your phone to go hear that, like when you shuffle. But this was with CDs, and then all of a sudden I had to start taking CDs out and putting new ones in, trying to find songs that I. So. I had I had a little I had a little buffer time between then like the 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 confirmation and the gig, and I was like, wait a minute, I work with a bunch of guys who play music. Why don't I just ask what they're playing? Mm. And they were like, so they so they gave me the hits, you know, like the ones that you kind of had to do when you were playing cover music, the Sweet Carolines, the Brown Eyed Girls, the that sort of stuff, and I so those, I got I got through those, and I was like, I you know, and I and to this day when I play cover music, I'm still similar to this. Um, I always wanted to have one or two in the pocket that maybe not everybody knew, mm. and just kind of you know like sneak that in. But uh, yeah, it was it was I'll never forget the first time I got a gig. It was. Uh, I think it was at the attic, which is no longer there. The guy who owned it, who's still a friend of mine, is now a radio uh, personality back in St. John's. But um, he actually threw me my 19th birthday, funny enough. And uh, yeah, he was uh, he was like, yeah, sure, you got a gate, you can open up, uh, you do a you do a 45 minute set or a half hour set at 10 o'clock. And I'll never forget it. My dad drove me down and drove me back. Like mm. he, he, like I drove, like he drove me down and then came back a half hour later and drove me home. Just because I was young, I 
technically wasn't supposed to be in the bar. Mm. And I came out, it was the first time I ever got booed because I forgot the words to Brown Eyed Girl. No! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was 17. It happened. Right. Oh, man. The audience. Oh, man. <laughs> It's like it's it's like it's hilarious because now you know obviously almost twenty years later I can I can easily laugh about it but mm. when it happened I was like ah oh, dang all right shake this one off and then get on to whatever the heck the next song was probably Wonderwall or something just like that <laughs> you know you mentioned audiences booing you. <clears throat> But what I love about Cavendish is the audience, and you actually mentioned this before, the vibe you get from them. Now that you haven't performed to a crowd of this size in two years, is there anything special you're preparing for, Cavendish? Um, I just, I just can't wait to see people. Like it's just mm. gonna be, it's just gonna be so liberating to kind of be there and hear music and and it's not even like obviously yes i'm very excited to perform and i cannot wait like i'm i'm counting down the days to get in there and and see it all but um in terms of preparation yeah there's some new tunes out there's, there's some new tunes that we've written that i'm very excited like i mean there's songs that i've written um over the pandemic that I've never been able to play for people, you know, like in person. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited for that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm excited just to like, you know, be, get back on the stage and, and, and see, you know, you know, people's interaction and people getting excited and, you know, people raising their beer cans or their, or their Dixie glasses or whatever the case may be. And just, without lack of a better term, be mm. normal. I mean, people, I've, I've done a bunch of, I've done several interviews over the, over the past couple of years, similar to like on, on Zoom or whatever. And people say, you know, like it's really hit the arts industry um, very hard. And I, while I do agree with that, it has, it's, it's crippled a lot of people, but I think that it's just hit us so hard as a society that I think this year when people get to go to Cavendish, it's mm -hmm. going to be, it's just going, like people are going to be like something shot out of a cannon and you'll just see people mm -hmm. as if they're walking through going, Whoa! <laughs> just because it's, you know, it, it, I, I I don't know. It just the thought of it. It's almost foreign now, but it's also exciting because I played Cavendish before and I played other festivals, and I know how much fun people have. So, in that notion, I'm just like, this is going to be incredible, and I'm just excited to see people out and not be under the cloak of fear mongering and you know, paranoia. It was like, oh, well, I might get this, I might get this, if this could happen, blah, blah, blah. They're just going to be, I, 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 I anticipate people are just going to be like, yes, I'm doing this. I'm excited. I get to see Luke Coombs. I get to see Darius Rucker. And that's just main stage stuff. I mean, the beautiful thing about Cavendish is like all the side stages, you know, we're doing the songwriter circle, we're doing the VIP tent, we're doing the kitchen states like there's just so much music and so much to experience and they run a a grade operation mm. i got to play it in 2016 with quentin ready i was i was playing guitar for him and i'm not kidding you they it didn't matter if you're blake shelton or if you were quentin ready's drummer they treat everybody the same. They treat everybody fantastic. They're nothing but accommodating. It is the most 
East Coast country cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason because it's special. Mm. Every person who works there, it's special and it's it's very warming and very, very inviting. Mm. And you you're appreciated and that's the difference. You know, there's a lot of shows that you do that um you're just there unless you're the big guy. You're just like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, we'll get you that in a minute. Not in this situation. Cavendish is a A grade. Um, they they put it off remarkably. Mm, no, totally agree. And I'm glad, like you said, we'll actually meet in person. I can actually wait to meet you in <laughs> uh in Cavendish and you know, super soon. Um, but it's been amazing talking to you, Chris. And oh, um, I cannot wait to actually watch you perform in a few days. <laughs> We, um, yeah, yeah, we're just, we're just, we're just like, I don't know. I just want time to rush. Yeah. But anyway, I wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your story and for talking to me. And uh, can't wait to see you perform. And uh, also, thank you for coming to the sanctuary today. I can't wait to meet you. And I can't wait to come back on here and have like our, our, our post chat about our meetings. And I also can't wait for you to come to Newfoundland. So that I can uh, I can show you how we do it over there. Yeah, you mentioned that, and I said I'm going to hold you to it. Oh, I hope you do. I really hope you do, Israel. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, brother. Take care. One more round. One more song. I'll get gone.